everybody. How's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys know this. This is Kevin from the Cool Progression Podcast. What's happening? City rocks are rocking and all thrive. Hey, it's another day in March here, and we've got a great episode for you. So, I absolutely want you guys to listen to one because this was enjoyable. Back to the podcast today is Jordan of the band Necessary Noise. Yes, we had him on once again. We go all through his latest single, Great, which honestly, if I had to describe the single, which we go in depth with, depth with on the podcast, it is great. And I cannot lie about that. Jordan also talks about how he got help from a rather famous drummer that he is good friends with to help out make this track as great as it is. And also, you know, we just banter back and forth, talking about different things, alternative rock, how Jordan benefited from COVID time off and just like, you know, being able to focus on just the music, learning different things about the music industry through this time. And we also talk about what we hope happens, you know, once we get back to normal, what's the first thing we want to do and also make a deal with them. Are you guys ready? Let's go. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners of the Core Progression Podcast, back in the month of May in 2020, this guy appeared on the podcast and we had a great time talking about music, talking about everything, and right as we were about to finish up, we had to go for like an extra 45 minutes because his dog showed up, and well, when dogs show up on the podcast, you gotta just roll with it, so please welcome, from the band Necessary Noise, please welcome Jordan, so Jordan, man, welcome back. It's good to like hang out and chat with you again, like. I'm super stoked, and maybe the dogs will show up again. Who knows? Probably at the 45 minute mark. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, man. It's been too long, honestly. Yeah, it's been a while. I still keep up with you on uh, like social media and stuff, but we haven't talked like face to virtual face in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been about almost a year at this point, but yeah, it has been a been a been a, been a fat minute. Yeah, seriously. Like I I didn't even know it was May of 2020. That's that's pretty nuts. <laughs> it's been a Actually, while. Let me let me look this up real quick to make sure that that's the case. Cause if I remember correctly, it was around that time. Let's see. Yeah, it was because when the episode came out, it was the first ever episode that I shot in the place that I live in right now. Really? Huh? I didn't know that. I mean, there... you changed it a little bit since too. I mean, not necessarily change it. I've more or less added things because there's a there's the falling in reverse box in the back along with two Spencer from Ice Nine Kills Funko Pops. There's two skate decks up here, both from uh, bands. And the, the 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 best one I think I added was the uh, Sign Rise Against poster. Oh, that's pretty sick. Who were the two bands? It was Rosie and another band. I forgot. Gold Frankenstein and Murr, aka GFM. That's cool. That's really cool. Skate decks, dude. <laughs> like. I'm doing merch right now, and the skate decks was not on my list of things. <laughs> like, that's so sick. I've actually got two more on the way at some point. I think they're shipping around June, so we'll see where they end up landing. Wow. Skate decks, man. I need to get on my game. Dude, that's really cool. <laughs> I mean, wow. it kind of, I would say it's like for a, for a piece of merch, it kind of allows you just to do these different designs, do some different kind of artwork. But also, it's just, you know, you kind of have this, like, it's a physical piece. Like, it's an actual artwork piece. But you can also use it for as a skate deck if you want to. Yeah, I know what you're saying. It's like you can hang it up or you can even ride it around if you want. (laughs) If I tried riding around, trust me, I would probably fall off in the first, like, 20 feet. (laughs) I haven't skateboarded for a little while. I mean, like. It's it's been a while, like I'd, I'd say high school or even middle school, like not not quite on my skate chops anymore at all. So, so if I tried and someone yelled, do a kickflip, I'd be like, I can't. <laughs> yeah, definitely be the same. It, 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 ser- it would serve better for me as artwork than it would be being used. So, yeah, I'm trying to see how many more I can get, though, because I kind of look them as like different like pieces to put up here. It's just they're 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 cool. They're different. They don't make a lot of sense. But then at the same time, they do. And it's like taking a look around my place right now, like seeing all the different things I have up on the walls. I'm like, oddly enough, it's like everything is cool, but those just stand out more than anything else. Yeah, they really do. Like I like I like your placement on them, too, that you can kind of see them. It's a, definitely a conversation art piece. Yeah. I think I think when I get the next two, there's gonna be one that has to go like right below this one, so it just perfectly shows. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Yeah, that's cool. I, is the other one gonna like cut into the desk though? If you put a fourth, 
Oh, easily. Yeah. Man, that's a slick looking like the desk blends with the wall really well. <laughs> it's 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 a it's one of those tables that um the if the and for the NFL the Bills Mafia would be throwing people through. It is just a plastic table, honestly. <laughs> really? Oh, pretty sweet. <laughs> I, I mean, I like when I moved in my, my when I moved out of my parents' house, moved to my first place last or er, in 2019. Like I'm like I need a fucking desk for something. I said, why well, don't I just get a big white table because it's cheap, it's long enough for what I need it for, and then I've got a whole big t- table to work off of. And it I I'm sticking with it right now. Yeah, that's pretty sweet, man. I mean, my desk is just littered right now, actually. I just bought a micro or uh, not microphone, a camera, so I can actually do this. But see if you can swing around here. It is just ridiculously stacked right now with full of crap. So I don't. You probably have way more space than I do. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll do in there doing the good old uh, showing of the desk. Yeah, for me, it's I've got like my little focus right mixer right there. Uh, one monitor. Yeah, little light. My laptop to to do keyboard that lights up and then on this side another monitor the wi-fi router <laughs> all the way in the back and then yeah more space because like i'd like i would have speakers up on here but uh shoot let me get this wrapped around back here so i can put this up nicely there we go like i would have had speakers on here but i mean i've got my vinyl player behind here on my entertainment center piece that's and then cool. the speakers are underneath so that's cool what do you use for uh like speakers uh let's see <laughs> Let me see what brand they are real quick. Uh, Klipsch. Which one? Klipsch? Yeah. Yeah, I know those. I used to have like some, I got them from Best Buy in high school. I had some really cool headphones that were Klipsch's. I like those a lot. I'll say this. They, they, they treat me well, especially when I was at a, uh, I had a, like a trivia night Zoom thing with some friends a uh, couple, like last week, just because people are all over the place. We wanted to all get together and do it. And all of a sudden, Everyone's talking, doing stuff, and all of a sudden people are asking me, "Who the hell is playing? Who the hell's playing that good music from like 2010?" And I literally turned around. My mouth player was open. Place was thing was running. I had uh, "What Separates Me from You" just rolling. I'm like, okay, <laughs> at least you guys remember good music, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My song of the day. What was the old channel name? You changed it like right when I was joining in May yeah. or uh, doing the podcast on May. What, um, what was- well, originally it was my song they rock two thousand to today, but I just ended up short uh, shortening up to MSOTD rock. So the MSOTD is still the exact same thing. I just shortened it up because it makes it easier to say, makes it a little bit shorter, a little bit more recognizable. Plus, if I want to grow it in certain ways, like I could do like a MSOTD country one if I wanted to. Would I run that one? Hell no, because I don't like country that much or at all. I'd have someone else who's really into it do something like that. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool for expansion ideas, like. Definitely, I wouldn't have gone as country as the first thing, but you do live in the Midwest, so <laughs> I miss Iowa. That you could probably find somebody in Iowa who would host that like right away. Oh, I know a bunch of friends that would host that. One of my buddies was interested in maybe starting up one with me, and he would want to do all more alternative music. And I'm like, you know what? I I, I told him if he wanted to do it, definitely go for it. I haven't really heard anything from him since. I think because he definitely he I know he got because he just got out of the Navy like. Uh, back in June or July. So he was trying to get on his feet. He got a job. He has a girlfriend. So I'm like, okay, you might be focused on that. No big deal. Makes sense. Here's a question for you. And I'm, I'm going to be made fun of for this, but what constitutes as alternative nowadays? Because I, I, you tell me or what you think. Cause I used to know, like I wasn't the snotty kid who like sub every metal thing, but I knew what they were. I was like, Oh yeah, this is crust core punk. Da, 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 you know, like, <laughs> whatever but alternative strikes me as weird because i used to know like alternative rock was whatever and then alternative pop was whatever but what is what is constitutes alternative now honestly i'm not a hundred percent sure myself because it's because when it comes down to like what i listen to for me i definitely got more into that like i started out basically like hard rock punk rock kind of stuff and then since I started doing this whole entire thing, I started dipping into more of the metal stuff, especially metalcore. Like that's pretty much where I end up laying and post hardcore as well. So I'm picking up on certain things, but when it comes to alternative, like, cause like the stuff that I used to think of as alternative, I'm able to break down more. It's like, okay, this is a little bit more pop punk. This is more emo, but when it comes to alternative, I'm just and like more like pop rock. So when it comes to alternative, I'm like, huh, I'm really kind of like messed up on this. So if it's up, if it's up it this way, 
How I know how I know it's alternative is if it's softer than hard rock, but I can tell it's not pop rock. I see what you mean there. Because I'm, I'm looking it up right now just to see what people would consider alternative artists. Because, like, so originally, let's just go with, like, alternative rock. That would be, like, Nirvana, R.E.M., and, like, Soundgarden. I'm trying to think of in the here. Um, Smashing Pumpkins, Pearl Jam. To me, that's just, like, the grunge movement. But, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of. But isn't alternative supposed to be like an alternative to like what modern rocks? Well, I'm sorry. At the time, that would have been called alternative rock in the 90s. But isn't that also getting like commercial airplay? So is it not really alternative because it's like on the mainstay stuff? See, see, I like what you said in the first part because it's alternative for what is popular at that point because coming out of the 80s and going into the early 90s, I mean, that hair metal, hard rock style was definitely still the prevalent thing. So when grunge came around, that was considered alternative, but then because it was its own thing, it ended up getting its own genre name. You take a look at the 2000s as well, stuff that would have been considered alternative, essentially pop punk. Yeah, that's true, because Green Day was alternative. Like when I remember iTunes, you know, like I purchased a Green Day album and said alternative rock. I'm like, okay. So yeah, I was I was submitting the um what do you call it? The metadata for the song that I'm putting out and that's a shameless plug right there, but um, <laughs> No, I was I was really concerned. I'm like, okay, I'm going to put rock as the first one, but as the secondary um genre. I was like, do I put alternative? It's like I, I wouldn't I mean, maybe pop, but like it punk wasn't an option. So I was like, I think I'm just going to do alternative just cuz that makes sense, I guess, but See, given given taking a look at like different things with iTunes and just how they classify their music as well with that second styling, I think alternative definitely would have been the way to go for you, given the fact that just listening to the song, seeing or hearing what it sounded like, and really getting a feel for it, it definitely would have fit under that alternative moniker. Again, had this been sometime like two thousand three, two thousand four. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, alternative strikes me as odd, but then also again, like in terms of like alternative pop, like. Billie Eilish has been considered alternative pop, but now she's like, you know, the mainstay. So I guess that I guess what we're finding out is that all alternative things end up became becoming the main thing, you know, and then there's an alternative to that. And then it just keeps flip flopping and recycling and no one will ever say fully alternative. Yeah. (laughs) Never truly alternative. (laughs) Never, but outside of actually talking about alternative music, I want to know what, because it's been about, you know, almost a year since we had you on the podcast. What have you been up to, man? I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, My life has been editing, mixing, and that's about it. Um, I think the first time when I came on, yeah, the first time, the only time I came on, but um, I was talking, I, I think I just finished up my first round of recording. And that was drums. And I met Sean. So Sean's a really good friend of mine now. Um, He's the engineer on the record. Um, For a long time, I kind of labeled myself as like independent. And I mean, still, I still am, but like, you know, self-sufficient, I'm doing everything myself. And so I have always done my own mixing, but for as big of a project as what I'm doing, I really had to kind of bring somebody else in. I still have, I'm still doing a lot of the busy work stuff, um, like the editing, a little bit of the mixing, a lot of like the presets and volume, like, you know, getting things rough, you know, and then Sean kind of goes in and finesses and I sit there with him all day long and just, you know, nitpick stuff. But I, I'll talk about Sean a lot more. Um, he's amazing. And if anybody, you know, is looking for an engineer, that guy knows what the hell's up. (laughs) Um, he's, he's really refined me as a musician too. Just like just watching him go and all that stuff. And just, you know, understanding what makes a good rock and track in terms of tone and editing and timing and whatnot. So, but yeah, I've been just that I've, I can't even say like, I'd say about 10 to 12 hours out of my day is always devoted to like editing or mixing or something related to the music. And then the rest of the time, I don't have time for 
things I would enjoy outside of that, like video games or watching movies, unless I'm editing while watching a movie. But um, yeah, it's just been like <laughs> like a horse with blinders on at this point and uh, just full throttling. That's really about it. <laughs> Makes makes a lot of sense, though, because I mean, also look at it during the time that we're in right now, because between the time when I've had you on the first time and, and today, I mean, we've been fully in with this COVID-19 pandemic. So what else is there to do? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, too, is um, I don't want to say I've benefited off of COVID, but shit, man, <laughs> I really have. If I wouldn't have had this time to. You know, I've never been really one to be fearful and like, I think we should be respectful of other people's boundaries in terms of like with the COVID stuff of other people are, you know, scared of this and really like, you know, freaking out. And I, I am too for different reasons, but I, I found that that time was 2020 was my most, I don't want to say profitable, but like productive. so much in that time frame that I was able to, you know, like really get a lot of shit done. It was like the most, what's the word I'm looking for, Kevin? Productive. Productive. That's yeah. Profitable was productive. That's the <laughs> word completely like so much, so much stuff has been done in the last year from when COVID started, which is well, about a month or a year now. And, uh, thank, thank God for that time. But also, you know, it sucks that live music's not going on. Um, I wish, you know, I remember we had a conversation about that. That is a big staple for the music industry. And I think forever the music industry is going to be a little different. Uh, I mean, like the vaccination, if people can get it in their system and in their mind that it's safe now, things will go back to normal. But California shut the fuck down, dude. <laughs> That's all I got to say, man. Things are shut down, so I don't know how that's going to return. I mean, I, I hope it returns rather soon. I mean, just because, I mean, for, well, I've always brought up with this, especially in the podcast when it comes to live music. It's a therapy for a lot of people. It's a therapy for me. It's therapy for the artists. It's a therapy for anyone that goes to the show because all your inhibitions go to the wind at that point. But when it really comes down to it, because what you brought up was, again, you, you, you're you saying you benefited from the COVID time, but I think this is a better way to put it. You took the opera you, you took the situation that was presented to all of us where yeah it's covid it's a pandemic everything got shut the fuck down and no one really knew what the hell to do and everyone was sitting inside sitting at home not really socializing not really going out doing much so with that time what are you going to do and there's a lot of people that ended up just sitting around I'm going to bring it up, watching fucking Tiger King and then watching whatever the hell else was coming out on Netflix, watching another season of The Mandalorian and waiting for that, coming up with all these different fan theories for WandaVision, even though I don't even know what the hell's going on. I have not seen an episode. I don't have Disney Plus or anything else that was coming out on like Netflix or any streaming service at the time or just waiting for sports to come back. There was a lot of waiting. There was a lot of biding time. However, there were a good amount of people like yourself and like myself included where we looked at this time where all of a sudden everything got shut down and it's okay. Everything is completely different. Instead of t- waiting for things to get back to normal or hoping that just, you know, like wishing, oh, I, if this would have been like, you know, normal, this is what we would have done, this would have done. No, we looked and said, okay, this is the time we're in right now. This is the situation we're in. What can we do with this situation to make it the best for us? Yeah, make the change you want to see, you know, do as much as you can with what you feel comfortable with. And, you know, like, and I do feel like, I don't want to say bad because that's like pitiful, but um, I do feel for the people that are in situations where they don't really, they can't do much, you know, like let's say they're not a musician, right? They're just stuck at home, like, and they can't find something productive or they have anxiety about COVID and whatnot. You know, I do feel for those people, but there's a certain level too, where you do have to try to find something productive to do during that time. If, you know, further, you know, learn a hobby or do anything, you know, outside of music. But going back to what you said though, man, live music is, yeah, it's, it's really therapeutic for people. And you know, that not having that opportunity to go see your favorite band or a local band, you know, to go see them live, it, it, it can be detrimental to, you know, even people's mental health, which really suck, you know, like we're all cooped up and we're having cabin fever. Everybody wants to go out and do something. And 
a lot of p- times that escape, if they're listening to their music on their headphones, you know, that's one sort of escape, but actually going to a show, man, that's coming back. If everybody, you know, connects the dots and follows the, the stupid guidelines and stuff, you know, <laughs> Well, I mean, I want live shows to come back as much as anybody else does. I said, when I have the availability to get that vaccine, people ask me, are you going to get it or not? I'll be the first one sitting in line at Walgreens be like, basically, hit me. Just because I want to go back to live shows. I want to be able to get back into a mosh pit. I want to be able to end up have potentially getting my head split open. But the problem is, is like, yeah, you're putting yourself in danger. Yeah, I'm putting myself in that position. I'm not forcing anyone else to put my, me in that position or put anybody else in that position. No, I'm just the one going in there. And if I get my head cracked open like I have beforehand, who gives a shit? It's not me. Very, very true. I know. Um, I'm going to preface everything I say with I'm not going to get too political, although this shouldn't be a political issue. Safety shouldn't be political, nor should the vaccine crap shouldn't be political. But it does. And everything's divisive. But my opinion is I think we kind of have to follow along with what people want us to do, like wear a mask. And I don't have a problem with that, but like, you know, wear the mask and do what you need to do and get the vaccine. And then maybe we can kind of return to a sense of normalcy. Because if we don't, there, see, that's a little conspiracy, but uh, I feel like people will fabricate things and, we will not return to normalcy because every time we don't do what other people want us to do, things will not come back to normal. (laughs) That is as general as I want to put it. And I'm not like a huge conspiracy nerd. I just feel these, I just don't trust the government. Doesn't matter if it's the left, doesn't matter if it's the right. I just, I've never been one to like that kind of shit, you know, and I will do the mask thing because I think it's safe and whatnot. And opinions are so fickle nowadays because we all get in trouble, but I'm just going to do what I'm told because, you know, I'm not going to put a fucking chip in my, you know, veins or something telling me, oh yeah, you know, whatever. And But I am going to wear a mask and I'm not going to, I don't know. <laughs> I think that form of, doing the mask and doing the vaccine, whatever is fine because it's not running my life, you know, if that makes any sense. But if they said, Hey, you know, you're instructed to do like stay indoors at all times then do this and are super like dictatorial about it, then no, I will not do that. (laughs) But I don't know. Thing gets weird. (laughs) I I think it is too. And I mean, given the fact that at the, like some, at some point in March, all of a sudden, like, again, you're, you're seeing states like Texas and Mississippi just open up completely. And I brought this up on a live stream as well, where I, I'm not going to get political on this. Uh, what I've said is I hope to God by like April that they are doing incredibly well and things are going very well because then we can get back to like all of a sudden other states start doing that. We can get back to some normalcy. I'm not saying that, you know, I like what I'm not predicting what's going to happen. I'm not trying to get political. I just hope that it's, it's a success because then other places will start picking up that we have the proof that it's a success. And then we can start getting back to, you know, bands going out on the road, us going to live shows. And then for everybody else that's not involved in music, you just go back to just living life like you had been. Right. And that's just the major point of it is we would like to return to normalcy. I don't think things will completely ever be normal just because it, it, it's a little harsh saying this is traumatic. For some people, it will be. You know, we don't know everyone's situation, but this whole shut in experience has been quite an experience. And getting back to the rhythms that we were once accustomed to would be really nice for a lot of people. Um, I'm not personally too affected by it other than, I mean, the biggest thing for me is seeing like local bands stop doing what they're, it's it's anybody who is doing something that's not a corporation or like a small business that gets shut down or they can't like operate their lives how they used to. That shit pisses me off. I'm very vocal about that. I've seen a lot of my favorite places close down and because they just can't survive in the climate. And a little bit of it has to go with adaptation, like maybe some new restaurants or some other restaurants have to do DoorDash now. And I do DoorDash just for like some income. And um, 
you have to adjust to that. But some, even with those adjustments and like, you know, a lot of businesses have complained to me, like, cause I frequent there with door dashing about, oh yeah, we like in California, we, we like put up the outdoor seating thing. And then they said we couldn't do the outdoor seating thing. And then like, if we don't follow the rules, we get fined or we get shut down. And then eventually they, they crumble and they end up shutting down. And I think, like I said, some things have been really traumatic for people during this experience that they can't return to normalcy. I really feel for those people, but as you said, I couldn't word it. You can, eh, we couldn't word it any better is that I just hope that this whole opening of Texas and, and whatnot, I hope it goes well because if it doesn't shit, <laughs> we're going to get pushed back again. Yeah. Again, it's, I just hope it goes well just for the fact that, yeah, you know, we're getting, we're, we've got another uh, vaccine that's available from Johnson and Johnson on top of the Pfizer and Moderna one that are out right now. And I know there was another company that was trying to make the vaccine, a vaccine for themselves, but they, when the Johnson and Johnson one came out, they completely nixed it so that they could help produce more for the Johnson and Johnson one, which I'm like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Cause all of a sudden you're getting, you're getting, you're getting more resources into, into making one that, uh, the uh, like the scientific studies on it have shown that it is working. So fuck yeah, I'm all for it. And then the more and more people that are able to get it, all of a sudden, it's not going to be a vaccine that's going to eradicate the thing from what I've seen, but it's going to end up making it more like what we deal with with the flu every single year, where it's going to be a prevalent thing. But if people get the vaccine and they end up picking it up, it's going to be nowhere near as rough. Yeah. That would be pretty nice. I didn't know all that. I've been kind of like trying to keep up with it. It just feels like there's different stuff on it every day. But wow, interesting. There, there's different stuff in it. And again, it's 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 so that we can all get back to some sort of sense of normalcy or like for people that have gone through this in a very traumatic event that is the pandemic, that they can get back up on their feet and get back going to a spot where they had been beforehand. And then all of a sudden, like with all the bands that have, you know, all the venues, all the bands that have called it quits and have shut down basically because of this. I mean, it's it's not a good thing just because think about this. There there have been so many great places that have shut down and places are still struggling. All of a sudden, what happens when things get going back up there? All of a sudden, you know, we're not going to have as many places to host shows and all these bands are going to want to go and host sh and play shows because they've been on the shelf for over a year. And this goes for both these large acts that are going to be playing in big clubs in different like large venues, even in stadiums as well to the emerging bands and the more local ones. Well, they're playing in smaller clubs and bars and whatnot. There's going to be a limited number of stages now and only a limited number of stage time. And there's going to be, so I, it, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, I'm not trying to put it as like a uh, band's going to have to try and fight it out for stage time, but in economics term, there's going to be competition for that stage time. Yeah. hundred percent. I don't remember if this was last year. I, I I feel like I'm having deja vu because I might have talked about it. But yeah, a couple couple venues I frequented in here in the Bay Area shut down, and a couple of them are in limbo. It's it's gonna be really hard. Um, it's just, it's gonna be it's gonna change for a while. I don't want to say forever because it's so finite. But like, yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be very very different entering the live band atmosphere where you know now those you know beer tickets and whatever that <laughs> we got it we're gonna have to really promote shows you know we're gonna really like as for the bands and the venues obviously but you know some venues aren't great about that they're like no you you the band you guys bring the, the people like we don't want to book you unless you bring people so and you know pay to play was like the worst thing to have ever happened like back you know when <laughs> before covid we're like oh fuck no pay to play but I'm, I don't know. I have an, I, I have a premonition that that's going to become more common and, you know, people are going to be more desperate for money. <laughs> and like you said, there would be a competition for sure. And one other thing too, to think about this too, from a fan's perspective as well, for people that are going to be going to these shows. I remember this is what this, I saw this right at the beginning of, like I think maybe this, maybe this is right when things were finally starting to just open back up a little bit across the country back in like June and July. So out for Mr. Bar Rescue himself, John Tapper, who's talking about coming back to the bars where 
yeah, if they're going to be open up, you're not going to get nearly as many people as you got before the pandemic because there's going to be three sets of people. The first set of people are going to be the people that, you know, they absolutely love that. That's what they do. That's their thing. And they're going to be the ones where, you know, when they first open up, this is for bars, but it also goes for live music as well. They're going to be the ones that are going to be flocking to these places, flocking to these shows. But a lot of the people that are going to be more your casual people or people that are still concerned about everything going on with the pandemic, they're not going to show up. It's going to take time for all of a sudden those second movers to come in and the people that, and then all of a sudden it's going to take time for the third group, which is the group that is still very concerned about what's going on until they absolutely know it's safe. Me, when it comes to live music, I'm definitely in that first group where all of a sudden I have a chance to go see a show. I'm going to freaking be there, but I'm not everybody. Yeah. Very, very true. Um, I think, uh, you said you live in Milwaukee, right? Yeah. I'm doxing you. Am I <laughs> shit? But okay. Um, uh, I feel like the Midwest has a couple more shows that are opening up more local stuff. And, um, I don't know. Have you, have you seen any of that or? Well, I'm actually, I, I looked up, uh, recently what's going on with the rave here and uh because that's the biggest one and looking at their schedule i mean every the the next closest possible one that they have that's still on the schedule is june if i'm if i remember correctly however the other one that's more local is this place called x-ray arcane i'm just pulling it up right now and they don't even have any shows potential yeah wow um I'm, I'm going to look right now too, just like San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, I was just thinking the Los Angeles forum just to see if they have anything. Um, this is more of a, an actual, like a big, big venue, but yeah, a lot of postpone, postpone, <laughs> um, new date, <laughs> new date. Justin Bieber is still supposed to show up on 14th of August. Harry Styles, but nope. Harry Styles is new date. I don't know, man. Yeah, it's. Oh, yeah, there, there's the MCR stuff. That's still not Eagles. Um, I don't know, man. <laughs> we're we're going to have to see for sure. Yeah. Oh, wait, scratch it. The, the closest one I see for the rave right now is there's two in April that are still supposed to be going. And then one in May that's still supposed to be set. Might go to the one in May, though. It's definitely not my scene. But come on. Who wouldn't want to go see Tech 9 live? Tech nine, yeah, I'd be pretty sick. I I think um at this point people just want to go see shows. It was like, hey man, I mean, I'm gonna see if I can word this and form a sentence. Um I think that local bands will be the first really to we're testing the waters, so to say, so that we are um when our community deems it safe, you know, we are allowed to, you know check to see how everybody is going to respond as long as we kind of pioneer this safety or safer environment for people and things don't go awry i think some of these shows will start picking back up again because I, I i just don't think that i don't know how they're going to do spacing and stuff at these larger shows unless you know everybody's like oh vaccine we're all good let's all do this i feel like we're all going to have to do the six feet thing and i don't even know how that's going to work in the pit it's it's yeah. not going to work in the pit but i think like with this, the shows that would have the pit in those larger venues they're not going to open up until they deem it fit to the point where if people show up that the majority of the people are going to be able to be vaccinated against COVID along with the people that maybe not have done so that again, like they might have like the, like it's going to be also an insurance thing too, that they are covered on liability insurance on that front. That's going to be another huge, huge thing when it comes to these shows returning again. Huge thing. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I didn't, I, I, I've thought about that, but like, I didn't, really think about the implications of that 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 will be something and you know i wonder if that's some when the vaccinations are made really um what do you call that I think playing on the word when everybody's able to access a sec yeah, accessible when it's really accessible to everyone i wonder if they're gonna make you like show your card or like i you know like hey i got vaccinated you know 
I wonder if that's going to be a thing. Like if it's going to be mandated. I, I hope, honestly, I hope not just because then it's just, it, it just adds more provisions onto everything. But what I kind of think is if everyone has had a chance to get as vaccine accessible to them, and after a certain period of time when everyone has accessible to them, that everyone has had time to be able to go and get it, then there's going to be people that don't go and get it for sure. Yeah. But, but then it's kind of like, that's kind of your choice at that point. So there's got to be a point in time where all of a sudden it's accessible to you. However, there's got to be a point in time where you've had enough time to get it to the point where, okay, we can start going back and doing all this fun shit again that we used to be doing before this all hit. And if something happens, well, you were the one that chose not to get it. So, yeah, there's just a lot of finicky things that we're going to have to sort through. But yeah, at the end of the day, I really, really, really hope music comes back or live music comes back very soon. Well, I know you said that you've been working a little bit more closely in the music industry as well. So I know you said you picked up some insights on this stuff as well. So I'm kind of wondering what things have you picked up during this time of the pandemic by jumping deeper into the music industry? Yeah, um, let me think here. Well, I, I think I can say this. I, I'm an independent contractor. <laughs> Is that the words I want to use? I help with run a company with um a team of people uh for something called music mastery that was um that's still headed by uh charlie walk who is the old um president of epic and republic i believe and um good dude and i uh i i just do a variety of things on the platform um to just help other artists kind of well, share their music is the one thing. It's kind of like a community-based thing. And also, um, Music Master just started doing distribution through Vidya. So I've kind of looked into that, and I've had a couple chats with the guys at Vidya. It's basically like DistroKid or like CD Baby, but it's like super personal because it's only like a small team of people like running the background. So if some small bands – I feel like I'm doing an advertisement right now. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, man. It's a shameless plug. Yeah, I mean, it's not even a plug. It's just like, uh, yeah, I, I'm just describing my job and I'm hating myself for it. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> um, but I think the biggest thing with being very kind to, you know, the company, every every job has its ups and downs. Let's put it that way. But I, I really think that I've learned a lot of what things are like. No sugarcoat, no bullshit. And even if there is bullshit, finding the truth inside of that, as cryptic as that is, I, I think that I, I've really learned a lot of what the industry coats and what they like and what they don't like and what a lot of artists that are, uh, it's mostly a pop oriented pro program. Um, no, no, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. Um, I've learned a lot about the pop industry through that program. <laughs> <laughs> that's as cryptic as I could be. I was going to say, is there any way you can give us some certain examples of things that you learned that you're able to tell us about? Or is it something where, I mean, like I shouldn't be like saying like, there's like secret, everything's run by one person or like Q or <laughs> something like that. It's more like, um, it's not secretive like that. I just trying to be like nice about it. So I'm not like calling out other artists, which I'm not naming anybody by name anyway. So it doesn't matter. But I, I, th I feel like there's a lot of, superficiality inside of the industry of like you know buying followers buying likes um unorganic methods of you know getting people but you know finding that balance of like how to how to reach an audience without coming off as non-organic and not coming up you know and not doing the whole i buy followers thing um it's made me ident made me like be able to identify what is fake easier or like, you know, I, I think that we all have a kind of a built in fake filter, you know, of what is organic and real and what is not. And I've, it's just kind of added to that. Let me think of things that are like positive. I can also say that I've learned. I've just learned. Yeah. Like, you know, I've learned a lot of money talks a lot of times um i've learned that if you you know like 
being able to support yourself with your music financially is pretty integral, but also like, like I said, finding a balance of what I can do without having to spend, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And are you going to be looking up music mastery while we're talking? <laughs> uh, no, no. What I've been doing lately is like on my note sheet, just to make sure that when it comes to actually writing out the bios for these, I remember like the rundown of what we talked about so I can make the bio the best possible. <laughs> No, I was just like thinking, oh my God, he's going to look up the website right now. <laughs> no, I'm not no. looking up the website. You want me to, I can. Good. It's, it's, it's interesting. I We've gone through that website five times. Charlie's never going to listen to this. So I don't really give a shit. <laughs> Maybe Lisa will. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Andrada. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've gone through that website like five times. It, that one's not my design. So I don't really give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i've i've run a lot of the tech background for that stuff people consult me for like gear advice i just did a call like last week about that um i help run for example like charlie was a, still is a big name in the industry just because of what he's done like he helped out like ariana grande he did t swift back in the day you know um a lot of pop artists yeah. but he's done like billy joel too that's i respect him for that Funny enough, he's like the fourth line on like System of a Down's credits too for thanking. Yeah, because Republic. So, yeah, I mean, like he was, he's, he's a, he's a good dude. He's a good friend of mine now. Um, but a lot of what music mastery tries to do is try not to alienate people. Um, cause I've talked a lot of, about the negatives, but, um, yeah, like we, I, we, I suggested way early in my tenure to like, hey, we should have like a dedicated day to play music back so that other people, and this is also before the pandemic, we were on Zooms a lot and we were, um, you know, trying to figure out a way for people to play their music on the Zoom to build like a little sense of community. And I think outside of music mastery and inside of music mastery, it's been cool to, allow people to like show their music to other creators and like get feedback. And that's kind of why I tried to help create those Fridays. So now I run 80 to 90% of those calls um, to allow people to just share their music and share like a little bit about themselves and, you know, have Charlie hear it. And he's, he's got a really good ear for, you know, like, you know, what makes a good hit song and, then you take that and do with it what you want to. Totally understandable. And again, it's just there's certain things about the industry that I mean, there's a lot of artists and then the people that are really doing stuff within the industry, like myself doing these podcasts as well, that again, over time, like I'm learning these things. But there's a lot of artists that, you know, they're I'm not going to say they're they're just not aware of what's necessarily like there's so much other stuff going on there that you're not fully aware of the full scope of the situation that the industry presents. hundred percent. And you know, like I actually take for granted sometimes like what, like I, I try to think of some people in music mastery joining as me in high school. Like what did I think the music industry was like? What did I not know? And like for new people coming on, it's kind of like, you know, ranging that experience trying to show that hey like we can all learn something here and we can all get feedback and criticism and we need to like learn what we can do for ourselves to further our careers in music if we want to do you know if that's the route you want you're choosing to take you know and just also like trying to make better music like I, that's something i've been trying to get the program to focus on too is like we've already got some pretty good artists on there pretty great artists and um just trying to figure out how to um you know even make them better so now there's a uh what do you call it music mastery studios production angle that um they started like seven eight nine months ago something like that and that connects people with like some bigger artists and or sorry, bigger producers out there. Like it, it's pretty cool. It's really cool. I'm, I'm glad to help out with it when I can. Well, cause when it really comes down to it, there was one thing I kept seeing and is there's a lot of things where there's, I've heard about different stories where different bands have been out there and other bands are trying to like push them down in order to like be the competition style. But in the end, when a band succeeds, if they're from the, if they play like the same kind of music that you play, if they're from the same area that you are as well, 
that's only going to potentially help you out because all of a sudden now this band might be get become bigger. People are going to get more interested in their music, but they're also going to get interested in the music that also comes from there and the same style of music as well. So why wouldn't they want to go check that out? I mean, a good example that would be, let's say, uh, let's bring up Japanese metalcore, for instance. Who would have thought that J Japan would have had a great metalcore scene? All of a sudden you get bands like Crystal Lake and Cold Rain coming out of there. You're like, holy shit. Can you imagine all these other, I mean, I found a couple other really good Japanese metalcore bands just based off of trying to search stuff like that. Hell, uh, Nick from a set like Wolves told me about one that he went on tour with. And I'm like, I want to get these guys in the podcast. They told me they couldn't speak English very well. I'm like, well, then how can we make this work? Because I still want to talk to you guys and get, you know, get more people to know about your band. Yeah. Territorial stuff really helps. Like, um, you know, if somebody hears a really cool band from the Bay, I mean, that's Bay Area punk. You know, that's a lot of where that was coming from was like, oh, we hear Jawbreaker and Green Day. I wonder what else comes from that area, you know, or Rancid, like all that stuff, you know, even like I'm trying to think here, like Midwest Emo. That's a perfect example. It's like everybody knows what Midwest Emo is now, but, you know, thank God for American baseball, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah oh god yeah no, that, that that also takes me back some guy there was a uh video from mr finn mckenzie the punk rock nba where it was like groups of like the worst fan bases and one was like the fan base of midwest or emo yeah <laughs> midwest emo actually my um my live bass player really really digs with midwest emo too like i do, I do too uh like you know it's good i shouldn't ever hate on it <laughs> they do riffs that i could never do so <laughs> I never really fully got into more of the Midwestern emo. I've definitely got into more of like the uh, the Chicago punk style. That's really where like I like when everything was kind of like popping off for me back when I was, I was like a lot of the bands are coming out of Chicago. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. And yeah, one of the people, you know, one of the bands came from that was uh, Fall Out Boy. Like if it wasn't for that scene, you know, Fall Out Boy, well. <laughs> not modern fallout boy but like you know like that old fallout boy really derived from that that punk scene yeah and then the, and then you get a band that came out of that punk scene still plays that kind of punk style that is you guys know what i'm talking about absolutely incredible with rise against yeah of course <sighs> yeah i'm gonna forget rise against <laughs> you're a big rise against fan aren't you oh absolutely riot fast man <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping they come back. I'm hoping it happens in 2021. I'm hoping that they're somehow on the bill just so that, I mean, I don't give a shit whoever else is playing. I, if Rise Against is going to be there, you better believe I'm going to be at that stage once again. I don't care whoever else is playing around at that time. I'm going to be stuck there. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot they're from Chicago. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. They were, yeah. Now I'm just going to look up like Chicago punk bands, you know. <laughs> Like a modern pop punk band from there is Belmont. Belmont's fantastic. Yep. You're cool. I know that. And there's like some other like punk bands that have come around like from like the more Midwestern area or even like a little bit further east, but still because they're like that Rust Belt area, like anti flag because they've come, they came out of uh, Pittsburgh. Yep. So it's just yep. like. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I. Um, a Bay Area band called Grumpster was supposed to go on tour with anti flag, I think last year i think that got canceled because that was big because they were like a band we played with, with as necessary noise and like they were just like a bay area favorite like the bull band uh just like a three-piece you know pretty modern simple pop punk bay area sound and yeah they're supposed to go on tour with it i i don't even know if that's still happening <laughs> i have to check like a lot of like one of my my friends uh nick nasab who's an acoustic dude uh, not only acoustic but like you know soft cool rock like got the whole flowing hair thing he's rad um he was supposed to do a couple little i don't want to say residential but it was he he was doing a couple gigs i think at the fillmore and or something like that and they got canned too i know we're going back to lamenting about live music but i'm sorry <laughs> but yeah it just sucks for a lot of the bands who had like we're gonna see if those local things got rescheduled you know I mean, I hope so, because there was a couple of local things that were happening around here that I was excited for just because it was there were some bigger acts that were associated with it. But they were bringing a lot of more local acts on either local acts from Milwaukee or local acts coming up from Chicago as well, even though it's like, yeah, Chicago, Milwaukee, two completely different things. When it comes to the music scene, though, within Milwaukee, there's not necessarily as much as there would be coming out of Chicago. So I'm always looking at what's going out of there. Plus, a lot of up. Uh, 
not gonna lie, a lot of my favorite bands were are based out of there. Chevelle, Rise Against. Um, even though I think only one of the guys lives in Chicago, like in the area right now, Disturbed. They all came out from that area, so. Yeah, I absolutely love what's going on there, but I was seeing certain things come up. Like all of a sudden, I forgot who was gonna play uh, with them, but it was like some. It was like two local bands, and then Thousand Below and Bad Wolves. I was like, "Holy shit, this is gonna be great!" Yeah, that happened. That was like the first show that got canned. I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> and those two week, uh, two weeks to flatten the curves sure lasted a while. <laughs> hey, we're at the one year anniversary of two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah, dude. Fuck. <laughs> oh man but what's the um outside of music what's something that you're going to like really appreciate coming out of this if but no when we come out of this <sighs> well it's gonna be music related in some way but it's 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 it's, it's different but the same and here's what i'm looking forward to most when it comes time to actually get back to this travel the reason being is because throughout throughout this year through or throughout 2020 throughout the podcast i i've been able to talk to so many different bands meet so many different bands virtually of course but i've met a lot of them from different places all over the world and i got i gotta throw in some of the names here some of my favorite um italian metalcore bands like stain the canvas e-line um I'm trying to think what was another one uh waves of autumn there's I'm trying to think there's there's other ones that i've talked to but i haven't gotten on the podcast as well a couple of german bands like pentastone um I'm trying to venues I'm trying to think of some other ones uh italian alternative band called uh let's see where the name is atwood i'm just going through my list right now uh I, there's a norwegian metal metalcore band called etna um shoot there's just there's a shit uh I'm trying to think of some more just to kind of give you a, a mountain eye out of the Netherlands, a couple of Australian bands, a couple of Australian artists as well. Like, um, and then, uh, wild ways out of St. Petersburg, Russia, their Russian metalcore. There's so many different bands that I've been able to talk to and meet from so many different places around the world, mostly Europe though. I'm not going to lie. And I had this whole entire plan to go over to Europe for like two, two and a half weeks and just bounce around to different countries and try and see as many of these bands as possible. And I was like, cool, I was going to be able to travel, go have all these crazy times, like see what the hell was going to happen. But the thing I was like looking forward to most when the COVID ends and we can get back to normal is being able to actually do that. And then show up in these bands home turf out of nowhere and be like, hey guys. That's cool. That would be cool. Yeah, travel. I didn't think about that. That'd be cool. Yeah, that, that you're you're playing like a, a real like European road trip for that stuff. That's awesome. I was thinking travel like I can't wait to go to New York or California, but you're talking like Norway. <laughs> and like that's awesome. Man. Yeah, like I know I'd like a whole plan because it was gonna be like I was gonna go to um northern Italy because that's where most of the Italian metalcore guys are, and I was gonna, you know, see a bunch couple shows with them, try and hang out with them. Um I had a friend who lives in Bratislava, Slovakia. Her and I were going to go to multiple different shows in Bratislava, Prague, and in Vienna. Because a lot of bands go through Vienna. So we were just going to hop around and do that. I was going to see go up to Germany, see a couple of shows. I was going to go back to Amsterdam, hang out with the guys from Mountain Eye. And also because Amsterdam's a fun-ass place and I wanted to go back there. And then maybe go over to London and hang out with some people that I know and see some shows there. Or if I need a, if I'm like, okay, just end it, you know, need a little bit of a break from live shows. I was going to go drink in Ireland for two days. Dude, I have a friend who went to Ireland, uh, like what do you call it? Study abroad. And she had just the most wonderful time. She said that she had like, um, it was just like a different experience. Like they, they treat life differently. It is not living degree to degree. And like, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I I really want to go to Ireland. Like all those places you mentioned, I really want to go to. Italy is on the top of my list. You know, I haven't been to many other, like especially. I don't think I've ever been to a single European country. Like, how about you? Have you been? Um, I was in Croatia for like three, four days because it was the thirty second Samaras thing. But I spent a day there beforehand just to hang out. And then on my way back from like, I gotta go somewhere else. So I spent forty of the craziest hours of my life in Amsterdam. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard Amsterdam, Amsterdam gets pretty crazy. So, Damn in, crazy. I'll put it this way: in the entire forty hours I was there, I bought my first drink. That was all I paid for. 
Wow. Wow. I had Heineken's coming at me left and right. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> for for two for two straight days. For two days. Dude, what a 40 hour trip. <laughs> Well, was the, I'll even, like the one one of the other fun things are because I'm not going to detail everything in the podcast because well there's some stuff that's definitely not safe for work if you guys are listening during your work work even though I've been swearing though you know I swear during most of these but I was I was walking back to my hotel at two thirty in the morning drunk as all hell I had no idea where the hell I was all I knew was I'm on this road if I keep walking in this direction I should run into it at some point took me 25 minutes to get there, but I ran into it. And as I was walking in, there was a guy outside that asked me if he could, because he lost his key, if I could let him in. Now, normally when this happens, I'm thinking, you know, are you a guest of the hotel because there's security protocol? Drunk me is like, what's up, bud? Yeah, I'll let you in. Who gives a shit? So I let him, so I walk in with him. I'm going up the elevator. I'm on the seventh floor. Him and he's like, hey, me and my friends are on the third floor. Uh, you want to come hang out with us? <laughs> and at this point, I'm like, well, everything has gone good so far. Let's keep this up. <laughs> so I go walk into this guy's, this guy, this guy's the room that he's staying in. And he's with, and three of his friends are there. And they're just drinking. They like, I forgot where, what country they were from, but they, it was, it was like, it, I forgot where it was, but they brought this like special liqueur that they they made in their own country. And they're like, do you want to try this? I said, well, fuck yeah. I've been drinking. Who cares? <laughs> so I was drinking and all of a sudden they're like, man, we're smoking some of this shit. You want to smoke some of this? I don't smoke. But I was in Amsterdam. So, <laughs> and I was hanging out with them till like f- four in the morning. And then my phone rang and the night continued on from there. But I'm not going to go into details there because that's where it gets a lot more not safe for work. And this might get pulled off of YouTube. <laughs> Dude, amazing. <laughs> wow. Makes me want to go to Amsterdam, you know? <laughs> oh, God. I, I got I slept two hours when I was there. For I was there for 40 hours. I was there for two nights in a day, and I slept two hours during the whole entire period of time. I didn't want to miss out on shit. <laughs> wow. That is gnarly, dude. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty amazing story. And uh, off the record, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out <laughs> what exactly happened. <laughs> Oh, off the record, that's that's gonna be like a 10, 15 minute story, but it is oh god, I, Jordan, you're gonna absolutely love it. Uh, that's but, awesome. But it's like remembering that story, remember the like what had happened during that when it was um doing the whole entire Mars Island thing, hanging out with people I'd met the previous year in, in California, also meeting a couple of new people as well, doing the crazy stuff with it. Uh and I mean like my friend, like I made a like the flag behind me, the American flag with like the 36 of Mars triad in there, fucking made that for it. And then if you still ever look at like the profile picture on any of my socials, you're going to see me holding the flag with Jared and Shannon Leto next to it. And of course, I'm wearing a Rise Against t-shirt because what else would I have been wearing at that point? Everyone else is wearing like all like white colored clothing and uh, all like 36 of Mars stuff. There's me in a Rise Against like baseball tee. <laughs> That's awesome. I think I even saw that on your on your personal. I think. Let me see. I'm gonna pull it up. Yeah. Is this it? Yeah. Wait. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna see. Uh, it's this one. Yep. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> I because I couldn't see the from the little like Instagram like thing, but yeah, that that's sick. This is your little. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, so like, so like, I mean, I was there for th- two, three days. That was fun as all hell. And I, I mean, I couldn't, and I couldn't just go, go there, and then like go over to Europe, do that, and then just fly back. There was no way in hell that was gonna happen. I mean, you gotta go do more. So like, that's what I'm looking forward to most when COVID ends, is because I want to go over and just be able to bop around these countries, let these bands know, like, and be able to find out if they're there, let them know that I'm in town, and like, if they're gonna be around, if there are any shows that are around, because I know a shit ton over there now. And it's going to be somewhere, hell, I go to a different show every single night. Hell, if there's a, sh- if I don't know a band, a band, if I know there's like a venue that has these kind of shows, I'm looking for like hard rock, punk rock, metalcore, heavy metal, whatever it might be, post-hardcore, emo, pop punk, whatever it might be. Hell, I'll show up there just to see what it's like and just to have fun. And then you never know, you know, they could, I could find a band I really like and then end up seeing other bands that I know and just showing up and all of a sudden, Crazy mosh pits, they see someone fall down in the pit and they're calling out like, can we get that guy some help? Wait, 
Kevin, is that you? And you just see my thumbs go up and everyone's just like, okay, he's fine. We'll talk to him after the show. <laughs> That's amazing, dude. When did you go? When did I you went go? in August of 2019. Okay. That's, yeah, that, I should have just looked at your, yeah, August. <laughs> Could have just answered. But hey, we got conversation out of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, well, now I got to ask you the same question. When COVID ends outside of music, even if there is some sort of music relation to there, but the core being outside music, what are you looking most forward to getting out of the COVID situation? You know, I asked that question to you and I didn't even have an answer and I knew you'd flip it back to me. And now I'm like, shh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really did. I just like, it popped up in my head. I'm like, huh, that's an interesting question. I wish I had an answer to it. Um... <laughs> i don't know fuck i i'm so lame that i'm gonna bum off that because i'm like yeah that's a good one travel i'm really gonna bum off that one i i think i think travel i'm gonna like filibuster my way into something else maybe but yeah <laughs> i don't really know because <laughs> i don't know what else is shut down i mean like this is not at the top of my list because I'd never go see movies in a theater, but it would be kind of nice to go see a movie in a theater. I don't really know. I mean, okay. Okay. We'll do this travel and I'll go into that later, but I think like having a large gathering that might not always be related to music, but also related to music would be cool. But like seeing friends under di different circumstances where they're not freaked out. Like I haven't, you know, been able to see a couple people because they're like really shut in and, you know, whatever. But they're like convinced when the vaccine like comes out, it's like, oh, perfect. That, you know, I'm not saying it's going to solve everything, but it definitely puts people's at ease. So put people at ease. There. But yeah, going going to see like large gatherings of I'm not really a party person either. But yeah. So, but I think uh, it's just or I mean, like just like the feeling of being able to go and see your friends and not have to worry about the certain, like taking health precautions where it's yeah. able to go back to like, you know, ha like sa maybe like standing around a bonfire, having drinks with like 20, 30 people, just enjoying the time and no one really caring about, you know, okay, there's a virus going on. So we have to stand six feet apart from each other, people yelling at each other about mask wearing and whatnot. And you just kind of want to go back to just the bliss of just hanging out with your friends. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm even thinking of, like, I wanted to hit people up and say, oh, I want to hang out with you, whatever, because I'm game. But, you know, a lot of people aren't, and I will get publicly shamed in a scarlet letter if I actually do that. But, um, yeah, it's it would be nice, you know, to not have to have to always worry about those kinds of things or other people's reaction, you know. Um, that's what I would look forward to at least bonfire would be cool. I haven't had one of those since Iowa, but yeah, <laughs> I'll say then, then, you know, jump, you know, if you can find a way to come out here to Milwaukee, then, I mean, oh, yeah. I'll, like I'll put it this way. Are we completely open up? No, but is stuff open up and there's stuff able to do. Yeah. One of my friends, he, it was his golden birthday at the end of February. And we end up going to this place called first and bowl where basically it's, they combine football, bowling and cornhole or beanbag toss or bags as we call it here in the Midwest. And it's just, yeah. And it's just, well, we, everyone was there. It was 11 of us. There were a bunch, there were other people there too. It wasn't super packed, but there were people there and everyone was just having a good time. That's cool. That's awesome. The way it should be. <laughs> exactly. So I can see where you're going from there, but now I'll make the question a little bit easier on you as well, because we're going to include music in this as well. So when we're able to get back to normal with music included, what are you looking most forward to? Um, playing shows is such an easy out, but definitely playing shows, you know, like that's a given. Um, yeah, I really miss doing that and, and interacting with people because, you know, it, it's weird with necessary noise. <clears throat> I, the band was doing so much live shit before and it was solely live stuff and we garnered traction off of no recordings and nothing and everybody always asks at the end of every show i should have had a tally marker of how many times people are like when's the recording coming out though when are you getting some music recorded and i've been so finicky about that that i was like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and i would have demos i'm like box of demos i want real shit and finally for the first time i have like 
recording recordings, like really good recordings that I'm proud of. And <laughs> there's no live shows. And I just find that serendipitous <laughs> almost like very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to connecting with an audience because that is it's been a while since I've been able to do that. Um, I saw a couple bands here in the Bay Area that were that did it really well and that inspired me to be the best frontman I could be. Um, and so as soon as we can get back, man, I'm going even harder than I did before for live shows because got to amp it up. <laughs> totally understandable on that and i mean i gotta piggyback on that with when it comes to me before i talk about you know your recording as well because there is a new song you got coming out which has already come out by the time everyone listens to this podcast that i want to go in and make sure everyone understands you know you got to listen to this song but when it comes to like like with music the two things i'm looking forward to most is first when it comes to live shows returning just that therapeutic and euphoric feeling of live music going there all your inhibitions, all your problems just go out the door. And for me, honestly, I'm looking forward to that first like punk rock, metalcore show, whatever it might be, jumping the mosh pit and getting hit for the first time. It's weird, but like when, like when I get hit for the first time, my adrenaline just goes through the roof and I know for the rest of the show, you cannot get me out of that pit. I just have to get hit once. The last time I was at a show with a huge pit was Word Alive, Escape the Fate, Falling in Reverse. I jumped in the pit and some like 280 pound guy just hit me from the side. I wasn't expecting it. Leveled me. I had the wind knocked out of me as I hit the ground. I did not leave the pit the whole night. Like I was in from there. I missed that. The other thing I'm really looking forward to is finally being able to, um, what's the word? Make good on some of my promises to the bands I've had on the podcast because there are so many bands on here that I have told that like, cause it's, I want to see every single one that I've had in the podcast and if I can, but the caveat always is, is I always end up having a deal with them. And the deal always ends up being the first rounds on me clause, which is yeah. me buying the first round for whatever they want. And some people have turned it into certain things like the band Rosie out of Texas. It's, it's not just first, dr- first round of drinks. Cause not all of them are 21, but it's like, pizza and burgers and ice cream and custard, whatever the hell it is. I owe Keith Wallen from breaking Benjamin a whole pizza, (laughs) which means I'm probably going to have to get pizzas for everybody in breaking Benjamin, which is freaking awesome because then I get to deliver pizzas to breaking Benjamin. (laughs) What a shame that you're going to have to do that. (laughs) How terrible. (laughs) No, that's cool. Or like, I'm trying to think of another one, like Benny from the band of void. Cause he knows, like he told me, like he came to Milwaukee one time for a show and he was hanging out at this cool bar where it was like a cigar bar. They played chess. And I like lit up instantly when I heard that because my buddy and I have been to that bar multiple times just to drink and play chess because we think it's great. It's a great idea. It's a great chill environment. I'm like, holy shit, you come to Milwaukee. I'll, <laughs> I'll meet you there, man. <laughs> and probably spend like half the day doing that shit. I'm totally down for that. Like I want to be able to start making good on these promises. <laughs> You can tell that I've actually been tuning into your stuff because I remember that story about him like doing the chess thing and, and what you said about the pizzas and stuff. But and then uh, the Rosie was underage, you know, I didn't know they were underage. Actually, I think I still follow them on Instagram. So, yeah, yeah I know I um, the drummer Molly, I think she's either 19 or 20. I know Zoe turned like when I shot the first podcast episode with them, I think it was on Zoe's 21st birthday. Wow, They're like sisters, right? Something like yeah. That? That's cool. And I'm trying to give another band. Expecting perfection. Like, the first time I see them, I'm bringing, like, three cases of Shiner Bach to hang out with them. <laughs> okay. So that means, with all that, what are we going to do when we meet up? We got to be <laughs> fucking insane. <laughs> but that's, that's a good question. I mean, well, I, I've got to put... I, I mean, I've had you on the podcast twice. i got to amp it up. I mean, every single time I'm doing something like this, like, it ends up being amped up at some point, especially with bands that have been on the podcast more than once. Um, like expected fraction, like Rosie, I still got to, I still owe Jonathan Norris from King collapse. I think a drink cause the first time I actually saw him live, like they were kind of running late and trying to set up some like, okay, can't really do that. And by the time they ended, the bar was going to close in like 20 minutes. <laughs> so I was like, shit. And that was, that was, that was like the weekend before everything shut down too. So I'm like, ah, shit, I still gotta, I still gotta pay him back for that. But yeah, what, what am I, like, what kind of promise am I going to have to make you to make this like incredibly epic? 
Okay, so you think about your promise while I make my promise. I'm going to make a promise. <clears throat> you go see a Necessary Noise show or even just hang out with me, and I will make you fettuccine alfredo because that's like the one skill I have. Like, I, I do a lot of different shit. I do guitar teching. I do a whole bunch of delivery shit. I do all this weird, you know, music production, pop advice, all this stupid shit. But damn it, I am proud of my fettuccine alfredo. I make it for all my friends. So I will, the first ladle of fettuccine alfredo is on me and all subsequent ladles of fettuccine alfredo is on me. So, and I don't care it, even if we're like, oh yeah, we met up at a hotel. I'm buying a stove top. <laughs> I'm buying heavy whipping cream. I am bringing all my spices with me in my backpack. <laughs> so I stay, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> very quickly. Um, I don't want to advertise this, but I stay a lot. I'm actually this next week, I'll be staying at World Class Audio, which is where my engineer is. And that's like the recording studio is literally a hundred feet away from his house. So it's like his own property. And I sleep over there because he's so generous and we're friends. It's not like something he does with other people like all the time. But um, yeah, I brought all my spices through one time and we made fettuccine Alfredo and I brought like my teas as well because like for my voice. And yeah, that's something I do. And it's really weird. <laughs> so, so now. All right. Even if it's even okay, if you, I'll put it this way. This is one more specific. If if I see you and it's here in Milwaukee or here around where I or here in Wisconsin or anywhere around there, where yes, I am totally down for fettuccine alfredo because I like food. I'm just gonna put it that way. I like to eat food. Who doesn't? I do. I do. I gained like 15 pounds since like two years ago. So yeah, <laughs> I like food a lot. <laughs> but here, if if that's the case. If it's, if it's, I'll put it this way, if it's in Wisconsin or somewhere around, what I will do is it's not just going to be one round. It's going to be me bringing two cases of some sort of like two different, like couple different beers from Wisconsin that are only like, like we're only like really brewed around here that you probably can't get or probably never really had. And I'm just going to end up being like, let's drink. <laughs> let's put Amsterdam to fucking shame. <laughs> That's going to be nearly impossible. If you can pull it off, man, I'm down for it. I'm a wild card, dude. Actually, I haven't drank for a little while, but I remember the times I did drink. Some of the times I did drink. Some of the <laughs> um, I, I'm adventurous. I like climb lamp poles and like, yeah, I, I do anything I fucking want. Like I remember there's a lamp pole near this venue that also got shut down, downer. But yeah, it was called Channel Brewery. And this lamp pole fucking way up there and just all of a sudden I just, I just remember like not blacking out but I was like up there and just having a great old time they're like Jordan come down <laughs> like no I will forever be up here <laughs> so yeah I don't know we will have some fun experiences for sure in Milwaukee all right, all right. if it's definitely Milwaukee though and that's how you and that's definitely how you act then I am definitely making sure that my best friend is there for that moment basically because he will do all that exact same shit. Like wow. he, like, like he, he went to Arizona for like a couple of weeks and he went to Hawaii afterwards. But before that, they were having like a little going away party from the bike shop he worked at. And before I left, he's like, Hey, do you want to, I, cause I had, I was hanging out with a friend also that night too. So I had to uh, leave. And he's like, dude, you want to hang out a little bit more? I'm like, no, I got to go do this. Oh, damn. I'm giving my other friends a scavenger hunt while I'm gone. Well, what are you doing? He said he bought different bags of like different like chips. And he hid them all over Milwaukee. But he hid them in places that you could get to, but weren't easily attainable. I'm like, are you are you just climbing buildings and putting them on roofs? <laughs> and all he said was, yep, that's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, the fuck? Dude, that's amazing. Holy crap. I'm just climbing different buildings. Putting chips. Dude, that would be a, a what a scavenger hunt that would be. Oh, my God. He, he, what he, and what he said was, like, how do you are you telling these people, like, where to find them or what the clues are? He's like, honestly, what I'm doing is I'm just going to tell them. I'm going to give them the address of where it is, but I'm not going to tell them where it is. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I, I I definitely want to partake, you know. <laughs> that, that would be a, such a fun game to do. Holy crap. Wow. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So that. So yeah. If it's if it's if it's in Milwaukee, if it's in Milwaukee, then that's definitely something we'll, we'll do. If it's in Wisconsin, again, I'm definitely going to bring the multiple cases. If it's outside of like the realm where I can actually like get that kind of stuff, um, I'm trying to think of another way to go about it. Honestly, I'm probably not going to think of it off the top of my head right now. I'll think of something where all of a sudden I'm like, <laughs> I'll show up with some random shit. Be like, this potty. Yeah, man. Just like whatever you want to bring, you know, bring your own blank. That's what the B means. Yeah, br- yeah, BYOB, bring your own blank. Exactly. <laughs> what, um, how far do you think? Ugh, I don't know where my phone is right now. It tells you how stupid I am right now. Um, how far is Iowa to Milwaukee? Depends on where in Iowa, though. Yeah, it's true. I'm just going to get oh, five hours from. OK, so let's see how far it is. I'm going to dox myself because there's nobody who lives there. Eldora, Iowa from Milwaukee. Four hours and it's even even cheaper or uh, not cheaper. Closer. <laughs> Less time. Closer. There we go. Madison. Wow. OK. Yeah, we're not too far. Cedar Falls even quicker. Five. Yeah. Four hours, 59 minutes. It's doable. So that means I would get there in about four hours and 15 minutes. Dude, yeah. Are you kidding me, dude? I drive like from California to Iowa straight through. I think I could, you know, five hours of my time. <laughs> Next time I go, I come to Iowa. I'll definitely hit you up. Yeah. All righty. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. I got to bring this up, though, enough with some of that stuff because I want to make sure people get to know about the new music from Necessary Noise with the song Great. So. I feel like we got to talk about that at some point because he sent to me and I'm sitting here thinking just like, I mean, I was listening. I'm just, I'm bopping with the whole entire time. Just like popping up and down like, holy shit, this is a fun ass song to listen to. So you got to tell me, what was it like making the song? Thanks, dude. Um, Yeah, I, um, it's the first, it's so stupid because last time I came um, on the podcast, that was supposed to be the first single and it truly is. I love K it's a great song and it's the first track on the record of the first record, but I really wanted to like define the sound. Like I was happy with the recording, but not to the level I am with great. And I always revise shit. Cause I'm just anal and perfectionist to uh, like crim. Like I- I'm very, very bad at like perfectionism. I need to learn to like accept what I've done and move on. But with great, that was another song that like kind of it, it's it's a great introduction to like some of the tones of the album. It's the second track off the record. Um, I, I don't know. Like there's a, there's a lot I can go into it from like the um, either the concept of it or the story behind like making it or even just like, you know, the production aspects of it and who, you know, like. Uh, what i've got done on it so take your pick of what you want to hear <laughs> um let's over the concept side of it just because i think when it comes to people really getting into the track and really trying to figure out what it's like and really get a deeper look into necessary noise i think knowing about the concept of the track and behind where that all came from is going to be like the biggest thing to really hit okay let's do that um and i can touch upon other stuff too a little bit but the, with the concept of everything um when I came on the podcast, I originally wanted this to be two albums. It was a little bit scattered and I didn't really understand like how I was going to do it and the amount of tracks. But over the last year, like I wrote a couple of other songs and I was like, this really fits inside the album. And I was really trying to find the ending to how, like I, I had an ending written, but there were some disconnects. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'll just try to fill it in with, you know, I don't know, like a T, I don't know, like a spoken track or something. But um, starting from the ground up, I I decided to make it three albums and each album. Well, the first album has 20 tracks. The second album has or it's more like an EP, but it's lengthwise. It's more like an album has eight tracks. And then the third one, which is the final act, is the, um, yeah, it's 20 tracks as well. Um, it's still the same concept that I came up with when I talked to you last time. I'll kind of like touch upon what the ideas are in that. But it, it talks a little bit about mental health. I It talks a little bit about like a personal journey I went through and still kind of go through. Um, but it also, I, I wanted it to be relevant to people um with different different stages of life as well 
um the actual storyline of the album or for up to like the part I, i'm willing to discuss you know just for you know album wise um there's a character called the dreamer and in throughout the first album the dreamer has you know met what is called like an angel starlight creature that's referenced in k and in great um it's hinted throughout the album the entire time that he's not able to really talk about his feelings. He's very insecure and he's trying to figure out his stage in life. Um, you know, he's a little bit younger at the time and he has kind of this glowing inner demon inside of him that kind of bursts out inside about, I don't know, fifth or sixth track of the album. And it creates problems where he doesn't really know what's real and what's a dream being a dreamer. And a lot of the latter half of the album involves him kind of like losing sight of what's real and losing, you know, hope in himself and faith in himself and losing his friends and losing, you know, a person that he holds close to him and losing like this angel star light, which the angel ties in for different ways, not to put like a, I, I'm not putting a person up on a pedestal. What I'm trying to do is like kind of show the distance inside that she only really appears to him in dreams and throughout like the sequence of albums or the sequence of the tracks on the albums, you as a viewer, you're kind of guessing whether or not he's inside of a dream because he would reference the angel in different ways that you think that he's in a dream, but then you switch back like basically back and forth, kind of like how he's experiencing it. So it's kind of convoluted. It kind of makes sense when you look at the lyrics. Um, and then very importantly, I wanted all the tracks to stand out in a way that doesn't like alienate the audience so that each track is good by itself. But if you add it up and connect the dots, there's a lot of thought put into it. And there's a lot of like, you know, I don't know, like a lot of people, I liked that when I was a kid. I don't know about you, but if you're looking at concept albums or like stories, like, or movies even, you would see all the Easter eggs and you'd get into it if you're really into it. And that's what I wanted to provide, so. Well, especially with like, I mean, I'm gonna use the movies as an example, especially with when, well, when kind of like we were growing up with the big thing being all like the Harry Potter movies and now recently, the past like decade, everything with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like all the Easter eggs that people point out, People definitely enjoy diving into something that deep and finding certain things about these different tracks and different, um, just the overall concept as well to just figure out different points in it, to connect the dots and overall just to understand the story behind what's going on in the album. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I I'm really, I've always been attracted to that kind of stuff. Just seeing like even before I want to say the internet existed, but like when you couldn't find that stuff on the internet and now you look it up on the internet and you'll find stuff you didn't know about it before that you even look, you're like, wow, that's amazing. And they still find, you know, all those stupid Buzzfeed articles, but like you find like, Oh yeah, 15 years later, this thing pops up and you never noticed it before this hidden theory, you know? And it's like, and it's cool. And I really wanted to try to have that insight to try to make it and even i don't want to say daily but like weekly i will come up with and be like oh shit that's really cool i should modify that lyric could i could i change like this little thing to fit this a little bit better um not always as drastic as that but i'll, I'll make connections of stuff i even did prior which that's a, a conversation itself what I, I won't get into too much but it's amazing I've put a lot of work into it, obviously, but it's amazing to see just how magical music is um, with things connecting and like little fragments of music called motifs, having like those motifs line up with other stuff that you've said throughout the albums for myself is just insane. I'm like, Oh wow. This makes sense because this is, you know, in line with that character to do this or, Oh, this isn't, this is really cool because like, of course he's here now. What if I switch this track around and have him not dreaming here? And you know, that kind of stuff is just, it's really cool to see play out. It is, it's almost like I'm not the one in control there as weird and mystifying as it is. It's like, there's an 
another, you know, the music itself is speaking, which is a huge part of what I want. Interesting. And when it came, when it comes to the song, great. I mean, specifically on this one, because of course that's the most recent one. I got to ask about it. What was the concept behind this specific track? Yeah. And I, I, I realized that you asked that question. I completely ignored it and just went to the full thing, but I kind of need to give that background. So you understand like every, like how this track is specifically. So on K, <laughs> I'm just not answering the question on K. It's mostly about Doug. Do you think of me as I think of you or like you, does this person really understand how I feel about them? Or in this case with the concept is like, he, the angel is so far away and it's like, it's a seraphim. It's a type of angel and it's protecting the throne of God. And because she's only seen in dreams, he's not able to communicate with her, which is kind of like an allegory. To, yeah, whatever. In great. He kind of realizes, like, I'm sorry, at the end of K, he realizes that, oh, wow, am I ever going to figure this out? Am I ever going to be able to speak to this person or the angel? In the second one, it kind of continues off that concept. Um, in the first half of the album, a lot of self-loathing ideals kind of show to kind of show his mental state. Um, that it kind of bleeds into great there. Like it has a little bit of like self-deprecative nature, but it, with the lyricism. But um, I wanted to kind of show kind of like unrequited love like it, it's it's the same kind of story of unrequited love on the first couple tracks but kind of how hopeful you can be about it and different stages of hope if that makes any sense it kind of does in a way when i was listening to the track though i think i picked up on something a little bit different though because when it comes to really guide diving deep into a track one thing, the first thing I was trying to figure out is, okay, what is the message being told? What's the story being told behind this specific track? Because then if you understand the message, then you can easily see a lot more where the instrumentation is going, where the vocals are going to really maximize on the expression of that story, the expression of that message, and just to really feel where the artist is coming from at that point. And I mean, yeah. when, I, when I looked at great, one thing I kind of, lately I've been kind of just picking up on certain things. And I think a lot of it also has to do with how we relate to these songs, our own experiences as well with the lyrics, because again, you can have a different intent to it, like with the concept that you're going off of. However, for me, if I'm not necessarily picking up on that concept, I could be picking up on something rather similar in terms of the story you're trying to tell, but not the overall full thing. But, and that also depends upon personal uh, experience as well. Where I was looking at this one, I was more on the, like the relationship side where you're like struggling to be open with somebody and when they're asking you kind of like what's going on are you okay are you how are you feeling and you want to express it but you don't know how to or you're struggling how to just to try and get past you're like i'm just gonna say i'm great and that's gonna be it and hopefully that just goes away yeah <laughs> i'm gonna be honest with you that 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 is what it is when you have 48 songs, yeah, when you have 48 songs in your brain and this huge concept you forget like why you wrote the song <laughs> And a lot of times what I'm doing while you're talking is I'm going back to my notes. <laughs> so I, um, a little thing that I did was I created, um, I don't want to say a book, but like a guide for all of the stuff. And it's, it's meant for an audience as well. There's some internal notes that are for me, but everything is laid out. If you want to know the concept, I want to keep a little bit of the beauty of interpretation, like you, what you have. But I also want for the other people who want to pick up on it to do that. And so I'm reading through the notes and I'm like, yeah, he's, he's saying what I'm trying to say there, but which is just not being able to communicate. Yeah, which is a huge part of the song. But another thing, I don't know if you picked up on this, is towards the end, I amp up a lot of different stuff. Like I add a lot of instrumentation, I add some solos, but I change the chorus not only the melody, but the lyrics kind of saying like, it's more, it's more hopeful. It's like uh, the chorus of the first two are like, do we find love in these unexpected places? Do we find love? And the last chorus is we'll find love. And I take it up an octave and I do this whole thing and I elongate things and have this grand orchestration of crap. And I'm, I'm trying to say at the end of it that he's, gonna try to communicate to this you know person or angel or inside the concept 
you know, I really think you're great. And that's actually, if you look at the lyricism, that's the actual first time he actually says something like, you know, I really think you're great, like directly to the person. So, and then it kicks off to another track and the next track he's, you know, and it continues, you know, and like it actually, there's something that happens in the third track where he actually finds her and is able to communicate with her. So it's a nice bridge, you know, not it, all like, it's so funny because the first two songs I've, I've released here are like this whole, Oh yeah. Unrequited love. Ooh, pop punk. Ooh, everybody's heard it. And I like these songs a lot. That's why I'm releasing them. But the album, it's just a short two song segment of that, you know? Oh, absolutely. And when you're talking about the like little differences you put in there between different parts, especially towards the end with the chorus as well, the different octave in your voice was something that I picked up on right away. I did tend to, I did pick up on a little bit of the change lyrics a little bit, but I didn't necessarily pick them up on them fully. So I wasn't necessarily aware of that. You kind of fully change into the will find love and really connecting with more of an, the character being more open and starting to open up a little bit more instead of just, um, kind of be more sure off and being like you know i don't know how to express i'm just gonna say that i'm great kind of thing but just the grand presentation especially in the bridge again now i'm looking at my notes too so ha, i can do the same thing to you looking at the bridge just how you amped it up and just the way you transition out of a couple of things where it was a lot grander a lot more powerful a lot quicker pace a lot like a little bit like of a higher uh like like a higher pitch in the guitars as well just the tone of everything i was like man this kind of reminds me of like how they transitioned out of the full on uh, bridge off of uh, Welcome to the Black Parade, just how grand it ended up feeling. I'm like, holy shit, here we fucking go. That's awesome because we use that as a reference track a lot because um, this is kind of gets into the like orchestration of the piece. We maxed out Pro Tools at 250. No, it used to be 259 we had to stop it at 256 tracks that's insane <laughs> we have over i think it was 150 vocal tracks on that thing like they're all spliced up and like you know cut different sp- spots and it, it's it's insane and i a long time ago i'm i'm, I'm a big my chem fan uh, um i read how chris lord algae who engineered black parade the actual album said that he got Welcome to the Black Parade and it was also maxed out. It was like 128 something freaking tracks. I'll have to look it up. I have it bookmarked. But um, they maxed out track count on that thing too. And his sub people, like the people who work under him, had to submix the song into I think 28 or 30 something tracks before he even looked at the damn thing. He was like, I don't want to see it unless you submix it. So like there was like a children's choir and thing. And like, yeah, they just put it onto like two stereo mixes and like all the guitars were like summed into one thing or like, it wasn't one, but whatever. Um, but yeah, like um, I definitely take inspiration from those guys. Uh, Black Parade was, you know, I still think of the way that they did a lot of the orchestration on that was pretty, pretty pivotal for me as a listener. And yeah, definitely use that as a reference track. <laughs> For mastering and mixing, I should say. Not for, like, the creation of it, but, like, making sure that all the things are heard inside of it, which was a chore. We spent five months mixing and editing. It was was nuts, man. (laughs) Well, I mean, in fact, you definitely used that as a reference. You were trying to put that out there. And, I mean, if that was something I picked up on, that's, like, kind of, like, use that as inspiration in terms of the overall how to produce this thing and how to mix it and everything, then you fucking did it. Thank you. That that it's amazing you you put that up there because that's it means a lot to me. It's cool that it bleeds off. Like I said, like music creation wise, it's not like Black Parade. Black Parade's much more anthemic and like grandiose and hist- histrionic and the whole thing. But you know, this is more of a pop punk tune. But the way I wanted the vocals to come out were very relevant to that. So we used that to figure out how to okay, well. You know, we didn't want the guitars to sound like that. Like we tried to amp it up, like, you know, all the different instrumentation we wanted to amp it up in a different modern direction. But um, the vocal tracks, man, like if you listen to that song again and just try, I'm going to actually run a contest to see how many vocal parts people can pick up. And no one's going to get the number right because it's just astronomical. (laughs) But I'm just I want to see how many people can pick up all the different layers of vocals like 
we have like nine ahs and o's for just one short like 1.5 to two second clip and it took up like I want to say three hours just doing the Oz and O's. Like it's so <laughs> stupid. Well, well, well now, cause you're giving me ex- uh, weird expectation to try and guess this. I'm going to put my guess as kind of a joke, but also might be right with 69. <laughs> Wait, are, are you guessing like 69 tracks or? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's 150. <laughs> Jesus fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's like I said, there's 200, whatever, 56 tracks for the full song, 256 like Pro Tools tracks, but 150 something of them are vocal tracks. I have to, I have to go back and look at them. Yeah, we maxed out Pro Tools, dude. We were like freaking out. We're like, how are we going to do this? Because we have too many tracks. And also, this is a total side note, just me to you and everybody who's listening, is I I chose great for a lot of different reasons. But another reason, which lined up perfectly, is it has the most tracks of any of the songs that are under like 10 minutes or whatever. But I needed a template because all we, we max out the plugins too on Pro Tools where we have 10 running and we even do sub busing where we have five more and seven more on that. So we're a bunch of different processing and subtle stuff. But um, yeah, we needed a template and we're like, okay, let's choose the hardest song that we have that has all these vocals and guitars running. So it served as a nice template for my 150 vocal tracks. <laughs> Well, kind of like when you were talking about like Welcome to Black Parade, where it had more of that like grandiose, more anthemic kind of style, where with this one came in with great, where it's like it definitely had that like, feeling, especially in the bridge when you kind of did those transitions. But overall, like you definitely create a pop punk track with a lot of energy behind it throughout this whole entire thing. Because just using like a faster paced drum line in the back end, that really helped keep everything consistently flowing throughout the whole entire song because. It just kept that overall pace. It kept that overall feel, kept that overall energy as we went from verse to pre-chorus to chorus. Yeah. You want to talk about the drums for a second since you brought it up? <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the fucking drums. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a lesson to anybody who has fear of talking to people. Um, I know have known Jared Alexander, who is the drummer for My Chemical Romance, for a while. And I'm not super, like, open to like I, I don't want to do too many press things about it unless I get cleared um because it's a thing but um he is the drummer on my record and he is amazing <laughs> and he um I don't know I I've I'll let me go very quick with the story because it's really cool I went to go see my chemical romance in 2000 I want to say 12 right before they broke up and I was in high school and it was three days or so into his tour and Mike Petticone got fired, their old drummer for things I can't discuss. And um, they needed a replacement. And they're like, we need somebody now on in the middle of a tour. And they got Jared because he is amazing. <laughs> and um, I remember seeing him and like kind of sizing him up because I like their older drummers or whatever. And I thought, this is my favorite drummer. I, I want to, I want to like, hang out with that dude someday like that's amazing and i think i like saw them back i I think i got like an autograph from a couple of them i saw him like walk down the stairs or whatever and i was i was transfixed i was like that guy's a cool guy i added him on instagram like in my i don't know say like three years ago or something and one day i just straight up like after having a communication with him i straight up asked him hey like could you take a look at my music I'm really struggling here because I don't have a drummer and I'm just, I need, I need some drum stuff done. I don't know if you could know anybody who would do that. And he took a look at it and skipping all the details. He's the drummer on my record and I love him dearly. He's a good friend of mine. Um, the ability to have one of your favorite people and f- favorite musicians and drummers and bands on your record supporting it taking instruction from you putting his own spin on it is just the most surreal fucking thing in the world (laughs) it's like it's so weird man and i i just um i enjoy him i i i was a little starstruck but not really because he's so personable that it doesn't really matter you know like he 
treated me like one of his own. And within the first couple days, we had inside jokes and stuff, and we've still been going and riffing on each other ever since. Um, he's such a good dude to work with, but he's changed everything for me in terms of like what makes a good drummer and what makes a good drum recording and also letting the, the drummer breathe a little bit because I'm so fucking anal about the drum parts where I'm literally like, tell him, okay, man, I need you to do this and this and this, and then I need your left hand to go here, your right hand. And he was such a trooper that he did all of it, but sometimes like I just needed him to, yeah, man, feel the air out on this. Like, do your thing. You were the drummer I got on this. Go for it. And he made great the track it is because the drum parts he added and we talked about and worked on like that, that thing in the bridge where he does like the, like this crazy snare thing. That's all him, man. I couldn't come up with that shit. I'm not that good of a drummer. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know, man. I'm super, I don't know. It just puts a smile on my face every time I talk about him. Cause he's just, I've never worked with a musician like that. I do everything by myself. Uh, other than engineering and having him come in and do that shit just blows my freaking mind. <laughs> so, well, I mean, again, when it really comes down to it, you, I know how much, especially when it comes to you writing this music and really putting it all together, recording and everything, it's all on, it's all, it's pretty much all you at this point, but being able to take some direction from him as well to just be like, okay, you know, he knows exactly what you want, but you know, he's been, like you said, better drummer than you are. So he might have some insight as well where it's like, okay, I can see where you want to go with this. And I'm going to try and do this where it's not going to be exactly what you wanted. However, it's going to produce the result that I think you want. Yeah. hundred percent. And you know, I, I do want to talk about Sean a little bit too, with that. Um, just in terms of shouting people out is, I already said this a little bit, but he is crucial to this now where I I'm so glad I have a friend in him. Cause actually Jared introduced me to Sean and he's like, take your pick, you know, of who we want to go with for engineers. And I called up Sean uh, and I went to go visit him the night of the, my chemical romance concert actually, or the day after I'm sorry. And I got lost and yada, yada. And I didn't know what Riverside, you know, where the hell that was. And I went to go visit him, shows me around. We go out for tacos and hang out like, you know, pre pandemic, like nothing, like we've been friends for years and having a friend work on, I I remember like three years ago when I was really stuck in a place where I, I was doing a lot of live shows, no recordings. And I thought, how the fuck am I going to get an engineer who is going to sit down with me and, be as anal as I am, maybe a little less because nobody's as anal as I am or whatever on these tracks. And then want me to allow me to edit and allow me to choose my takes and comps and allow me to be the other engineer in the room and the other mixer. And then I met Sean and it, it was just like, and he and Sean are, and Jared are good buddies and they go way back. And it was like having the best team in the world. Like, I don't know. It's like, I don't know, man. It's really cool to have those guys help me out with my crazy fucking shit that I like to do. Um, and uh, and speaking on the whole anal thing, he is way more anal than I am. And I fucking love him for it because I've never met anybody who is like, no, man, this needs to be like this, you know, like this guitar. You need to hit this thing like it owes you fucking money. Like, let's do this thing. <laughs> so, man, if it weren't for Sean, I would not have that song sounding as good as it was. No way. You know, I'll say a quick note. Now you're making me think about still drumming. That's pretty much my drum sound when I was a kid. When I was a drummer, was I hit every single drum like I owed it fucking like you know it, like it owed me some fucking money. The amount of drum heads I broke that my like parents had to, like helped me replace. I mean, pro- I mean, I, I was a drummer for like four years. I think I probably it was probably close to like twenty or thirty. Talk to me about drums. I didn't know you drum. I do. I did when I, I did between the ages of ten and fourteen. Hey man drummer for life bro <laughs> and, and, and like i wasn't I, I wasn't i was getting okay at it but then it was somewhere i was like i was in middle i was in grade school middle school so i was like i was always like you know like oh orchestral bands i'm always on the snare drum all of a sudden there was like a jazz band thing that i ended up getting into and was playing a lot of uh like just doing a lot of like simple stuff on a drum kit all of a sudden eighth grade rolls around and i jump out of that but i stuck with drumming so i was taking lessons from somebody else here in milwaukee 
And oddly enough, he's in like this like weird like Vegas style ba- like lo- like local band here in Milwaukee that my cousins absolutely love, and I had no idea about it until after I stopped taking lessons from because I stopped when I got in my in high school to the fact that I I could either spend all my I could either spend like folks on my time like any extra time I had because I also played soccer like playing soccer or drumming, and I was much bigger into sports that time, so end up sticking with soccer and. As, as, as like as a cool event to continue drumming, I'm glad I st- went with soccer because I love playing the sport. I still play it if I can. But I'm also thinking, like, if I stuck with drumming, I could have jumped potentially into all this stuff a lot sooner. But, oh, well, I'm here now. I'm learning all things about you. A lot. I didn't even know you liked soccer like that. That's cool. And the, the, I'll put it this way. The two songs I was the best at playing when I was uh, a kid was uh, When I Come Around by Green Day and... This might throw you off though, but I got really good. I cannot remember how to play for the life of me anymore. I got really good at chop suey. That no, I don't know. That was the weirdest thing in my world. I was like, I bet he's not gonna say chop suey or some system of dialogue. Like, that's <laughs> fucking weird. That was weird, dude. I was that's like I almost spit my my water drink thing back in. Holy crap, that was weird. That was like I was gonna say chop suey. That's so weird. <laughs> Out of all the songs. Like the thing is really? like I I can exactly cool. remember, like, I can't, I don't remember, like, what to hit, but I remember how it, like, how it went. I remember the... <laughs> it's funny, because... <laughs> like, I remember all that shit. Oh, got it, dude. Just got to put a drum kit. First, first round of drumsticks on me. <laughs> oh, I got a... F- round of drumsticks. <laughs> Oh, I got, I got, okay. I got a funny story for you then. Cause it just happened in February. It was Super Bowl Sunday and I was over at my parents. I was watching the game with my dad and I was sitting on a chair and like my foot kind of slunk in between the chair. And I felt like something that was, didn't feel like it was supposed to be in the chair, but it felt like a hard kind of like rod shape kind of thing. And I felt the other side and there was nothing there. So I'm wondering what the heck fell in between this chair. And I pull it out, and it is a Vic Firth drumstick size 2B. Man, those are man sticks, right? Uh, sexist, but <laughs> those, are, those are the big boy sticks, man. <laughs> and I started laughing hysterically. And my mom came downstairs. She's like, Kevin, what are you laughing? I'm like, I put, I held up a drumstick. She's like, oh, my God, is that a drumstick? I said, I've been looking for this drumstick for nine years. Nine wow. years. I had no idea where it was. I thought I lost it. And it was in <laughs> this chair that we have moved around that the cushion has come off multiple times. How? And now I have my, I have my, like my, because I, my original pair of drumsticks were always five a, but I'm like, no, that was my favorite pair of drumsticks it was a Vic Firth pair of two B's with the uh, nylon tips. And I finally found the other one. <laughs> That's amazing because it makes me wonder how many guitar picks are stuck under those couches, you know, different places in the world. Because a drumstick, what am I measuring here? No, a drumstick <laughs> is not, <laughs> a drumstick is not a small thing. <laughs> Fuck. Okay. A drumstick is not a small thing. Like uh, how would a guitar pick, you know, like there's probably thousands of those things stuck underneath my couch somewhere, you know, like the fact that a drumstick got lost for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this though. If I ever pick up drumming, if I get like an e-kit and put it in, in my, in here or something, I'm not buying sticks. I'm getting the, I'm cause I still have all my old sticks. I have them somewhere in my parents' house and I'm pulling out the two B's that you should, man. They are, are, they are, they're all chunked up though, too. Don't get me wrong. They're all chunked up at the, like, because constantly hitting on the rims and whatnot, but I don't care. I want to use them again. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I have an electronic drum kit that I have banging around. If you ever come up to the Bay, well, I actually have a full drum kit in the back in the room. What am I saying? Yeah, that's one of the places you need to travel is the Bay Area because I have a spare bedroom, man. So <laughs> the, there we there we go. Also, okay, so enough with the drum stuff because I, I again taking I'm just gonna say it's taking a look at the time just because I know with the podcast I do I love talking about. It, I just want to end up being able to wrap up with great as well before we you know send each other on our merry way because you've worked so hard on this track. You've had help from those guys. And when it comes down to it overall, again, I've listened to the whole thing multiple times, ran through it, 
And I always put the little overall tie in at the end of it. So when I look at the meaning, the instrumentals, the vocals, everything, and everything you said about it definitely hits. And I wrote overall, Jordan's created a song that really gives a great addition to the pop punk genre. While the instrumentals really stand out as a plus on this track, it is his work matching up his vocal changes with the overall guitar tone changes throughout each part of the song that creates a more dynamic sound and feel that flows very well. Check it out when you get the opportunity. So everyone, if you're listening, just just wait till the podcast ends and then go and check out the song. Heck yeah, don't close out of the podcast yet. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. That's a great write-up. Thanks, man. <laughs> you do my bios from now on. <laughs> Well, well, if, you, if I'm going to do your bios, you're going to have to like, just, I'm going to have to, I mean, it might take me a while because like going through this track, like every time I go through a track, it takes me like 15 minutes to go through it now. I used to do it in like five minutes, but now I'm just going so much more in depth with these things. I'm just like, okay, here we go again. Let's see what happens. I'm finding out some shit that I've never found out before with certain these tracks. And this one, it was just listening to it. Just, uh, it was the way the, like now I'm seeing why 150 vocal tracks really stood out because Holy shit, just the way the guitar tones were. And every single time, like every time something changed, you changed along with it. You didn't change exactly with it, but you changed along with it just to keep the style going, especially in the pre-chorus because the energy just gets turned up to 11 on that one. Again, got to credit Jared for the drums on that one because just the way the fills work on that one was fantastic. And the movings and pacings especially amp up the overall energy in the song. It fits in so much well with the pop punk style. But you amped up your overall intensity in those pre chorus as well with the vocals, and you paced them to fit that uh, tone and that louder sound even more. And it was just a great move just to keep this driving energy through the whole entire song. Like, I thought the pre chorus was going to be the thing that stood out to me the most on this track. Then I heard the bridge, and I'm just like, motherfucker, how'd you do that? <laughs> and now I know you maxed out Pro Tools. <laughs> <laughs> that bridge is, is death, man. <laughs> The bridge was a lot of work because I also had all those contrasting vocals. But thank you. That's cool. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. Um, also, because I know you're more of a metal guy, too. Um, a lot of the range of different stuff happens on the third album, but I'm doing some of that stuff earlier as singles. So there's a lot of I wouldn't say like super metal, but I, I, I can scream OK. And like I'm not the best screamer in the world, but I have my own unique way of doing shit. And there's a lot. There's one track where I just go full on scream, which is a lot of fun. But yeah, there's some more harder tracks, which, you know, in time, I'm shooting you. First awesome. person get. I was like, because I definitely have gotten into more metal stuff, but mostly it's like where I reside again is in metalcore because it has that metal mix with hardcore punk and many like punk, hardcore punk, I am all in on. So when I start hearing that more metalcore, I was just like, ah, yeah. yeah. And I'm still like that to this day. <laughs> the way to go, man. It's, it's good stuff. <laughs> Especially like for Moshin and Getting in the Pit. There was a song called Vitriol that I can't wait to release. And that's probably in the distant future unfortunately but that song is pure energy like i was even yeah i just can't wait for live shows to come back and energy and nice little wrap up <laughs> now sir as we wrap this up i gotta ask one question on that song before we go into the full conclusion of this is yeah. that a song that i'm gonna be able to split my head open during the pit and if i do split my head open as we somewhere be like i'm good this is fun yeah I used to do wall of death to that song. I would, I, there's a, a middle set. Hold on. Oh, the puppies need to come in. Yeah. They're chewing up my toys right now. So they're going to come in a second when we do the conclusion. But that song I used to do the wall of death on. There's like this middle section where I just like, I'm like, okay, you, this side, you, this side, everybody. <laughs> like when the thing kicks in, go. And it, it's a lot of fun, man. I miss doing those kind of things. I miss being a, part of, I miss being a part of those things. I was, I almost broke my nose to be able to lead one side of the wall of death and it worked. And I, the kid that almost broke my nose, I, I locked onto him and I leveled the shit out of him. Of course, picked him right back up. We were all good after that. <laughs> Let me get my dogs. Come here. Come on. Come on. Oh, there's the one. Are we going to get the three? Come on, Emerson. Come on, buddy. Come on. Come on, teddy bear. Let's go. Oh, oh no, don't. <laughs> There's the two. We get two. Dude, you want? Yeah, don't get between Teddy and a cheeseburger. Come on. He's the fat one. Come on, Teddy. Come on, puppy. Come on, fat dog. There you go. That's a body. <laughs> All three of them. All three. There they are. <laughs> They've grown up since you last saw them, dude. They have. Yep. Hi, guys. See? Yeah. Get me attention. They say like dogs pick up chicks, but they also pick up viewers. <laughs> TikTok likes dogs. 
Oh, I'm definitely going to use like the like a still shot of this with the dogs as a like, piece of the promo because it just works. Okay, ready? Woo. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, all right, Bert, as we conclude this podcast, one of my favorite things to do is always give you a chance to say something at the end of this. Plug whatever you want, say whatever you want. So, Jordan, right now, the floor is yours. Do I own the floor, really? No. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be smart. I don't know. I got to pee really bad. <laughs> That's my plug. No, Um. yeah, check out Great on all the uh, streaming services and stuff. It'd be sick. Uh, tune in. Uh, Necessary Noise. Uh, let's see. I don't know. Facebook. Instagram, TikTok, Snap, Snap, whatever <laughs> you guys use. I try to be on it all. DM me, you know, if you like the song, uh, awesome. If you don't, I'm so sorry you don't. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is Teddy. This is, which one are you? Freddie. This is Emerson. I'm Jordan. Necessary Noise. It's at n-e-s-s underscore noise on instagram and i think tiktok's just necessary noise so check all that stuff out thanks for tuning in comment like and subscribe (laughs) oh i'll do that on on the intro and outro don't worry about that (laughs) do the whole thing I'm all, all not the whole like, you know, like influencer thing i'm just gonna i just have fun with it i'm not like comment subscribe like yeah no, I, mean, I always just say like if you if you feel like it, I guess. But please do. But just something like that. But okay, as I close as I close this one out for myself. So everything that Jordan just said, where you can find necessary noise online, everything like that. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna make it easy as hell for you guys. Just look at the description of the podcast, YouTube, stuff, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio. I'm just gonna put a thing that says find necessary noise online. All the links are gonna be there. Make it super easy for you as possible. When this podcast ends, great is available. So go and check that out right now. Again, it'll be, I'll have the link to the stream where you can stream the song as well. So they'll be all down there as well. Also, Jordan, again, hope live music comes back so that I can make good on that bet when it comes, or make it in the deal, bring you a shit ton of beer and have some of that, you know, fettuccine Alfredo that you're talking about because I am hungry. And on that note, cannot end this podcast goodbye because we got those plans checking time on there. You know how I end this. It's a good old, see you later. Well, well, folks, that's my interview with Jordan from the band Necessary Noise. Yes, so he comes to find Necessary Noise on all of the platforms you need to find them on. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, uh, Instagram, um, a- any other thing we can find, and along with Great as well. Please look at the description of the podcast for YouTube, other Spotify podcasts. We play iHeartRadio. I'm going to have all the links under the Find Necessary Noise description. Also, please make sure when it comes to the podcast, MSOTD Rocks, you like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Subscribe to YouTube if you're not. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, make sure you're subscribed as well. Honestly, I would do the whole entire, leave a comment and subscribe for the algorithm and all that stuff. But you know what? I'm just going to say, yeah, please do that. That'd be a freaking awesome. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the Corporate Crush Podcast because we're just going to keep making episodes like this where we're just going to have fun, have a great time. And on that note, that's going to be for me, guys. Thank you for watching and listening to the Corporate Progression Podcast. My name is Rocks Rock and Roll Thrive. My name is Kevin. And you guys know how I end every single one of the big, healthy, and hearty. See ya. Yeah.